Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have Coach Bob Williams of Fork Union Military Academy on with us this week. And uh, Bob has a unique experience because he started his coaching um, at a junior college in New York and then coached at Glenville State in West Virginia, taking them from a losing program to a, a winning program in five years. And then he spent 17 years at West Virginia Tech before he took a couple years off and then joined Fork Union three seasons ago. So we talk a lot about you know his transition from college to prep school, how you turn a team's culture around. He gives a lot of good information on what the experience is like at Fork Union, how kids get better. We talk about the alumni network at Fork Union and all prep schools out there and how that's a big benefit to go on top of everything else you get from going to a prep school and, and much, much more. So um, enjoy the podcast with Fork Union's Coach Bob Williams. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Bob, welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you having me on today, Corey. Now you've been, you're starting your third year at Fork Union. Um, it's a military school, got a great history. For those listeners that aren't familiar with Fork Union, tell us a little bit about it and what makes it a special place. Well, it is, I found it is a special place. I knew that, you know, when I was coaching in college and developed a relationship with the legendary Fletcher Eric, who coached here for close to 50 years and kind of put the basketball program on, he did put the basketball program on the map here. And, and, um, Fork Union Military Academy sits in a tiny little town of Fork Union, Virginia, halfway between Richmond and Charlottesville. And uh, we have 300 um, boys, uh, grades 7 through 12, uh, plus post-grad basketball and football. We're starting up post-grad lacrosse. And, and we have all the regular sports like any high school would. And uh, we're a Christian military boarding school. Gotcha. Now, you got there two years ago from the college ranks. Um, what did you learn during your first two years being in prep school? Yeah, it was totally different. Um, and I, I was a small college head coach for so many years. I was, and then I, I did a semi-retirement in 2019 to 2021. And, and uh, during the pandemic year, so if you're going to do a retirement, it was probably two good years to take off. And, um, and but so I missed the game. I knew I had to go back to work because I had two kids in college, or one in high school and one in college at the time, two in college now. And and um, so I, I wanted to coach basketball again. And, and I looked around the country and applied for some jobs and was fortunate to land here at Fork Union and um, back in the game. But I I learned quite a bit. Um, you know, the first year I, we'd be in the middle of an early season practice, and I'd be looking around, where's the seniors? Where's my seniors and where's my leaders? And I had a whole team of 18 year olds. So I was the only one that knew anything that was going on with the teaching the system and all that. And um, so I, I didn't have anybody to demonstrate what I wanted done. And, um, but it, it was all young kids, you know, 18 year olds, you know, are just fresh right out of high school. And um, But I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the level, uh, was able to utilize a lot of contacts I've made over the years into this job. Um, with helping a recruit, you know, recruitment and placing players around the country at various levels of college basketball. Perfect. Now, when you got there, what month did you get there in the summer? I got the job in August of 2021. Okay. So, so was your team so the first set? Team, yeah, the first team had already been there. I inherited that first team. And how'd that go? Because, you know, your previous coach recruited these guys. And, yeah. you know, one of my big things is you pick a prep school based on the coach. How did that go with you now stepping in as the new guy with being not who they expected to be there? Well, I think if it was a regular school, there might have been a mutiny against me after the first two weeks of practice. <laughs> but um, we had some growing pains with the kids, but eventually they all bought in and we ended up having a great season. We were ranked as high as number three in the country that year and and went to the Nationals, um, Adam Finkelstein's um, um, group up in Connecticut in the um, went to the sweet 16. So it was 127 games. So it, it was really a nice rewarding season, a great uh, first year, you know, to just come in and inherit that kind of team. 
Yeah, I think the first time we met was in New Haven, and that was one of your first games. And you upset – who'd you upset up there? Um, uh, Brewster, Brewster, St. Thomas More. Brewster, yeah, and St. Thomas More, yeah. Oof. Yeah, that, that's how we jumped into the top ten. We, <laughs> we beat those teams, you must be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, not a bad way to start uh, in the prep school ranks right there. That's right. Uh, so what kind of player are you looking for at Fort Union? Because there's all types of kids looking for prep schools, but obviously Fort Union's it's – and Hargrave and Massanut and are kind of their own unique animals. You know, what do you want in a kid to come and succeed at Fort Keenan and on your basketball team? Well, I mean, we want talented basketball players like anybody does. And then we want high character individuals that are willing to be coached, uh, want to work hard, put the team first, unselfish, value academics, and um, they want to improve on a daily basis. And, uh, and, you know, as coach, you coached, you know, in Kentucky and some other places. And, you know, every coach has different tastes and players. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to say what do I look for. But, you know, obviously I look for talent. But then right after that, I've got to find out what kind of person that, that player is and what kind of family they come from. And um, and then, you know, it's got to be the right fit, you know, uh, being a military academy we can't just show up to an AAU event and just go up to a kid and say, Hey, we like you. As soon as he says, sees military on my chest, you know, it's that they can't get away from you fast enough, but um, it's just, um, but once we get kids on campus and we have a beautiful campus, great facilities, you've been here before and um, you know, and a uh, great tradition here. And so um, it's a great opportunity for somebody that's looking for a prep year or a link year or a postgraduate year. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think so highly of Fork Union. This is before you got there, but I actually brought my cousins there as one of the three prep schools I thought they would thrive at. And nice. uh, they ended up not going to prep school, period. But, you know, I thought that would have been great structure for them. They were football players. And um, but the one thing that terrified them was the lack of cell phones. So can you can you chat a little bit about that? Yeah, the, um, we're, there's no cell phones allowed on campus uh, from the cadets. And um, now when we travel, um, we hand out their cell phones. So it's like, you know, we're getting a Christmas <laughs> present. <laughs> yeah. They're excited when we, when we, when we travel quite a bit. I mean, we, we probably play in six or seven states and we travel, you know, over 40 games schedule. And so they have their cell phones off campus. Now they do have phones in their rooms. And uh, the other thing, the big obstacle that we found, it may be bigger than cell phones because this is only an eight month, you know, ordeal right. where they're coming here for, uh, business purposes and it's to get better in basketball um maybe some might need to improve their gpa or test score but but really they're coming here to get better in basketball and position themselves um to a different maybe set of colleges or a different level aspiring to get to a different level um get stronger you know what have you but um uh, the other thing is the big thing is cutting their hair you know all right uh, you know a lot of kids have hair down to here nowadays and um that's a we had a kid have hair all the way down to his butt last year and he cut it um and that that's a you know um that says a lot about him that he would do that and come here and how important basketball and in college basketball and college education is to to that young man absolutely are there are there colleges aside from the academies that are there certain coaches that require kids to keep their hair cut do you know um, other than the military academies, those are the only ones that I know of. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if there was one out there like, Hey, this is the rule. Maybe there's not, but back to cell phones with kids, not having the cell phones on them until road trips. Like, what do you notice as a coach and a parent that is, is like, do you see a difference in the kids in, in one way or another without having that around? Um, a lot of the kids that I've had in the last two years have said that didn't really bother them. They got used to it. It allowed them to focus better. Right. Less, less screen time. So, and then you we're up, you know, we're noticing because our team lives on the same floor in the, in the barracks, the dorms, they all live together. And then we have 11 players this year. And then they sit together in the dining hall as well. Same table. We're together all the time. We've already had nine practices this year and, and we've been in the weight room quite a bit. Um, so they, I see their communication skills improve, you know, just from having to talk instead of 10 guys right. with phones around the table, you know, <laughs> and uh, maybe we're even adults. We're guilty of that. But um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, this, um, 
And then if it's an issue, it doesn't, it hasn't really been an issue with recruitment because they do have laptops that they're given here and, and um, they can use their phones for a couple hours in the evenings in their rooms. And then um, I also, you know, I'll keep the parents updated. I'll take pictures of the, of the kids on campus and their uniforms or their practice gear or whatever, or in the weight room and I'll send it to the parents or else, um, you know, if they're homesick, I'll, we'll call the parents from my phone. And, um, and so, but, but email is, is how college coaches have been getting in touch with them or college coaches will call my office and I'll have the kids sit in my office so, and get on the phone. Yeah. Perfect. Now, when you recruit, you know, obviously you get the basketball pitch, but what do you tell them when it comes to military commitment at Fork Union? Like walk me through what you tell a family that either scares them off or doesn't scare them off. Well, we were founded as a military academy, but we're also a Christian school. And um, so our, our kids go to chapel three days a week. But anyways, we're not preparing. Our mission is not to prepare people to go into the military. We're a college prep program. So 100% of our students are accepted to colleges and universities. And and some some might, couple might go into military, but most of them, you know, our top cadet last year went to Army West Point. And uh, some will go to Navy and, and even Air Force, but BMI, Citadel. But most of them are just going to regular colleges and universities, you know. And so their families sent them here for structure and, and discipline. Discipline is not a dirty word. It's, you know, it's a form of love in the Bible. And um, but so we, we don't do a ton of military stuff. So the military stuff comes into play is you got to get up at 6 a.m. during the week. You've got to make your bed and you have to make sure your clothes are in order and everything's your room is clean. Um, they'll do room inspections maybe once every couple of weeks. Um, and, and then putting on the military uniform of the day, whatever uniform of the day they tell you to put on, um, they'll put it on and wear the uniform that day. And then you're in class most of the day. You have a morning break for 45 minutes to an hour. That's when you come in the gym and get on the shooting machine and you're getting extra shots up where I work them in small groups or whatever. And then, um, then they go to lunch after lunch, they go to, back to class for another hour and then they're um on the courts for practice after you know then the other things with the military is morning colors raising the flag saluting the flag teaching them how to mark march and be in formation and then um in the evenings and those things only take about 15 minutes really to uh retreat the flag down um study halls in the evenings mandatory in the dorms lights out at 10 o'clock so real really you know, in an eight hour day, they might do half hour stuff of military where the rest of the stuff is just um, academics and basketball and, or in, in food, you know, eating three meals a day. So that takes three hours right there. But um, and so they're they're busy with um, with the regular things that you would be busy at any boarding school. It's just they're wearing a military uniform while they're doing it. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I get it. Hey, we're gonna do a quick pause here because I don't know if you can hear. I got a woodpecker banging on my office. I'm just gonna bang the wall. We're gonna keep rolling because I don't know how many podcasts <laughs> haven't gone. Wow. But those joys of living in the forest of Colorado. Right oh there. yeah, I'm sure it's beautiful <laughs> out there. I'm gonna try to take my team out to play uh, Air Force prep one of these days. Well, I tell you what, they've got like a Juco Jamboree that Air Force Prep plays in uh, in the fall with a bunch of junior colleges. So that might be something you want to nice. look into. So after yeah. this, I'll tell you who to contact. Okay, great. Get a Thank good you. bang for your buck. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I when clients come to me, right, I can tell pretty quickly, you know, which kids I want to present the option to. Like, hey, would you be interested in a military prep school like yours? or not. And I kind of give the rundown because full disclosure and everyone that's a regular listener knows I went to, you know, air forces prep school before I played at air force. So I was not a military guy at all and went there. Parents weren't in the military. Grandparents were in world war II, but everyone in that generation was, but you know, I didn't know any better, right? I didn't know what a normal prep school was like. And yeah, we had two weeks of basic training, but if you're an athlete, it wasn't that big a deal getting yelled at. Hell you getting yelled at by coaches, your entire career and everyone's there with the same goal and it's supportive like people at these military academies aren't trying to beat you down and kick you out right they're trying to build you up and get you better for the next level so i can kind of tell which kids are very interested in it and want to learn more and want to talk to coaches like you 
And there's others that just say, no way, I want nothing to do with it. And it's similar to a certain, certain clients. I was like, Hey, do you want to go to a single sex school? And, and some kids want nothing to do with that. They want to be co-ed. Right. So you probably in, in your recruiting have to figure out real quick. So as not to waste your time, which kid has it and can handle this and would be open to this and which kid would. not So how do you quickly cut through that to not waste your time with somebody? Well, a few years ago when my son was playing high school basketball, you know, Hargrave talked to him and, and I thought Hargrave would be a great place for you. And he's, he just first thing he says is I don't want to go to an all boys military school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, looking back now since that since then I've moved on to Fork Union and he's been here a lot and works out here. You know, I've you know, maybe he's changed his tune. He took a walk on spot at Marshall at the time instead. But anyways, um, you know, some kids won't even return your call, you know, once they find or your text, uh, because you're at a military academy. Um Hopefully kids are raised the right way and have good parenting where they're at least able to communicate that to someone, you know, say, Hey coach, thank you so much for your interests. However, you know, I, I don't want to do a prep year or I really don't would rather not do the military academy. Yes. Now, once we get kids to visit on our campus and they realize you're not, we're not out in the woods working on military maneuvers during the day. We were in yeah. class just like any other school. And then we're working on basketball and it's eight months of improvement, getting stronger and better and more exposure. And, uh, and if kids realize that now half our team, first two recruiting classes have been people that have contacted me and wanted to come here. They're pretty good players. So we looked at them and evaluated them and they recruited us just as much as we recruited them, maybe more so, but they're good enough to play here and play at the college level. So it was a good fit. And then it was a good fit for them. And, um, and then the other half are guys we have to really go after you know, very talented players. That, um, and then we, we lost a bunch. I mean, but we end up, we, we usually end up getting a good recruiting class. So. And how do you find your players? I know you mentioned AAU previously. Are you looking on websites? Are you calling your college coaching contacts? Like what percentage of your roster is being built of you being proactive versus taking kids that have reached out to you? Yeah. You know, I'd say probably half okay. our team. Um, well, maybe 25 to 50% of the team. Um, our kids that reach out to us and then um, we had one recruiting um, thing where we brought in 30 kids you know and looked at them that way and then other times we would just bring in one at a time um, just through contacts around the country that I've I coached in New York for 10 years before I moved to West Virginia where I coached for 24 years in college basketball and and so, um, you know, you just use your contacts, but through your high school contacts. And then there's there's people like yourself that consults and help place kids. And we have friends with some other people, too. And then um, and then, you know, a big part of it, what really helps us is Fork Union alums, Fork Union yeah. alums, spreading the word, had a good experience here. And there's a lot of Fork Union alums out there in college coaching, high school coaching um, that we'll recommend a kid. And if they have the kid's ear, you know, that's how we get good players sometimes where somebody will just say, Hey, you, you really should go to Fork Union for a year. You need another year of development exposure. It's a great place. I went there or I have a friend who went there and I know of it. So a lot of times those, that's your best bet is people helping you because they have an affiliation with uh, Fork Union Military Academy. And Bob, you're coming on year three, but can you tell the listeners some famous alums? from Fork Union? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was surprised when I got here. Um, I didn't know about the football program here because I just heard about basketball and basketball circles. Basketball has sent 12 to the NBA and guys to Kentucky and North Carolina. Shimon Williams um, was starting point guard in North Carolina and played uh, for a little while in the NBA. And um, uh, Mike Young, the head coach at Virginia Tech currently, um, he played here for Fletcher Eric. And um, so, um, you know, a lot of good ones have, have come here. And, um, but uh, to find, then when I got here, I found out 130 have gone to the NFL from here and two Heisman Trophy winners, including Benning Testaverde, Eddie George, um, and then um, Kevin Plank, the founder of Under Armour, went to school here. Um, uh, Clarence Thomas's son went here um, during 9 11. President Bush's chief of staff son was here at the time. So, and Secret Service will send their kids here sometimes. Um, 
but we, we've had some famous alum, alums send their or famous uh, people send their kids here and it's a it's, a, it's one of the pres most prestigious uh military academies in the country melvin turpin went there too back in the day yeah and he's he was in that movie air a recent movie um air about jordan signing with uh, nike and all that and um they kind of ripped down Melvin a little bit in that movie, but I remember seeing guys like Melvin Turpin and Chris Washburn, you know, play when I was in high school um, in New York, play on TV. Yeah, well, Melvin Turpin and Sam Bowie were both featured prominently in Air, right? Figuring yeah. out which one Nike wanted to take on. That's right. Fun, fun fact: my uncle was their backup at UK for four years. Oh, nice. So uh, he never played because he had to back up two lottery picks. But when you back up two lottery picks, he still got drafted in the NBA oh, nice. because he had to battle with those guys every day. So it's funny. Uh, yeah. Those are great teams. I enjoyed yeah. watching those old Kentucky teams. I, I was a big Kyle Macy fan. Oh, sure. I coached with Kyle Macy back in Kentucky. He was a, he's a high school tennis coach now and he would help right. out uh, sometimes with our basketball team. So okay. re real nice guy, but yeah, he's uh doesn't have the hair like he did in 70. Yeah. Uh, he had good hair when he was young. Yep. Great hair. Great <laughs> hair. Um, well, that's cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, let's go back to college now. Uh, you coached at West Virginia Tech for 17 years. Uh, you know, obviously, I've heard of it. I grew up in Parkersburg. So, and my dad okay. played West Virginia, mom went okay. to West Virginia. So, I've got 304 roots um, in my blood. Awesome. And, uh, but tell people out there that maybe don't know much about the level that West Virginia Tech was in. Tell us about the conference and some things that people just might not know about it. Well, when I first moved to West Virginia, I was the head coach at Glenville State for five right. years at D2 in the West Virginia Conference. And I moved to West Virginia Tech. We were also in the West Virginia Conference. After, I don't know, four years, we moved back to the NAI. So then Tech moved around, jumped around different conferences and um, and so it's kind of, it was a great way to meet a lot of people because we were kind of the vagabonds in West Virginia where we would move different conference every two or three years or different levels. And, um, but really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, when I was in New York, I had the, um, the best junior college team in New York state mm -hmm. and I got the Glenville state job and I had the worst D2 job, worst D2 team in the state I inherited. And, um, got that job late. I have a history of getting jobs in August. <laughs> So you have to learn how to coach as a young 30 something year old, you know, and, and uh, we, we eventually turned that program around. And then, and then at West Virginia tech was the same thing. Got the job in August late, inherited a team, had to build. That's one thing I like about coaching here at Fork Union. Now I don't have to build and just reload every year right. and uh, get new, get a whole new team. But, um, but uh, being in West Virginia, that's Parkersburg's one of my favorite cities in, in West Virginia. And, you know, you know, I'm sure you have great um, feelings for West Virginia and people in West Virginia. And I raised my family in, in Charleston, my two kids. And so, you know, they say sometimes you are you're uh, where you're from is where you raised your family. And so I, I'm a West, I feel almost more like a West Virginian than I do New York, even though I was born in New York and lived there for 32 years. But uh, West Virginia is, is really definitely home now. And I uh, love it there. I uh, had a great experience at West Virginia Tech. You know, it took a few years to build the program back up. But then um, the last several years, we had a good run. Went to the four national tournaments in the last five years. And um, had several 21 seasons, All-Americans. And it was a great experience. And uh, our last team there in 2018-19 went 30-5. and five mm. And went to the – we got upset in the Sweet 16. We were number three in the country. And, and we had two All Americans and four senior starters, and so after that season, I was—I don't. This might have been the only, the last chance to win a national title here, um, and we fell a little short for our, of our goal. But but it was a great experience nonetheless, and I just felt like it was time to step down. I was thinking about either doing something different, going into administration, or or something totally different. You know, just ready after thirty years of coaching. You know. Yeah. Now, but tell me about this. Like, what do people not know about that level? Like West Virginia Tech, there's good players. Like, where would you get your players from? Were they D1 transfers, JUCOs, local, international? Yes. Good question. Um, somebody just asked me that yesterday. And I said, we, we've always tried to recruit half in West Virginia, half out of state, because and there's because it's a small population there. Sure. And then, and you, there wasn't many bigs in West Virginia. So we would we would recruit half high school and half transfer also. 
So most of the kids we got from West Virginia were high school kids. And then some of them ended up to be really solid players and, um, and key contributors and great leaders, a lot of pride because that was their first school. And then transfers, a lot of several junior college kids, some D1 transfers that that last season, we won 30 games. Um, Elisha Boone transferred from um, St. Peter's in New Jersey. He's from New York, 6'4 guard, and was first team All-American for us. And was, you know, was a major impact guy for us. And uh, But we had a really good mixture of in-state and out-of-state, mi mixture of high school recruits and four-year recruits and transfer recruits. Perfect. Now, when you go into a place like Linville State and a, a new job like West Virginia Tech, you have to change the culture around. You have to imprint your ideals and, and ways of doing things into that program. Rank to me, like, what are your first three major steps you do when you when you get to a new program? I'm sure you did this before Kenyon too, but like, you got to change a losing culture around. Like, what? Give me the top three things that you focus on to get done first. And it and it takes time, you know. You, yeah. You know, I think a lot of young coaches make a mistake sometimes and try to hit a home run in that first year or short take shortcuts. And I think the the important thing is don't don't take shortcuts and do the right thing. So bring in good character people. And that's one thing I learned too in coaching. You got to bring in better character people because they're going to be more coachable and more unselfish and work better as a team. Maybe a little less talented, but. Um, I think he, I found that I've gotten further with that type of player, but at Glenville, we probably, we had to bring in better talent to start out with. And then you instill your culture of hard work and togetherness and, um, and day by day, um, and set daily goals. Just, you know, you're reaching, you're looking for long-term goals. Now at, at West Virginia tech, when I got in there, I think the, the kids were talented, but they were partying also, you know, they wanted to, be regular college student. You can't be a regular college kid, you know, go to party, all the parties and never miss a party and still play basketball at a high level and in a winning basketball. So we had to change the culture there and get a more spring in a more serious um, player that just, you know, so focused on academics and basketball only the, where they didn't. And it was such a, both those towns are so small. you got to really bring in kids that don't really need that third reason of social life. You're, we used to just recruit and tell players, you, you're coming here for academics to get your degree, and you're coming here for basketball and to be the best player you can. If you're looking for a third reason, you know, you probably should just go to Morgantown, WVU, where they have one of the best social scenes around. But we don't have that. So, you know, that's a sacrifice you have to make. But tell me this. One thing that stood out to me you just said was when you got to Glenville State, you needed better talent. Well, every coach wants good talent. So how do you implement that? And especially Glenville State, like I've been to Glenville. I had a player go there uh, that went to Hargrave and it it's tiny, beautiful gym, yeah. but just a tiny, tiny town. So like you got to make a pitch. Uh, hey, we're, we haven't won in a while. I'm a new coach. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, how do you just get talent? And Glenville had decent tradition in basketball. They just were a little down when I took over the program, but, um, you know, it, I mean, it's 15 miles off the interstate through winding roads, but the yeah. community is so supportive. What a great, I really enjoyed my five years there. And, and we played in the old gym, the small little gym, which was a home, yeah. real home court advantage. And the conference, when we were coming in the West Virginia conference, which is now the mountain East conference and it's still strong. There was four teams in the top 20, you know, my first year in 97, but, um, and so we had challenges every night, but um, we, we ended up building the program. We, we brought in a couple of West Virginia kids that ended up Jacob Tolley was a six, four local kid. He ended up coming in and being a four year starter, pretty much three year starter, two time captain was, was an excellent player and leader for us. And then we, we brought in six, eight a kid from central Connecticut state transfer. He ended up leading the conference and rebounding. And um, was very good, um, Dominique Liverpool. And then Hugh Brown um, came, we got him from Allegheny College with Bob Kirk in Maryland. And then, uh, and we mixed in a couple other JUCO transfers with good high school kids in West Virginia. And we just, you know, we just felt like if you run it the right way and you, you always tell kids the truth and you support them, be demanding without being demeaning as a coach. And um, and then you can build something. And 
my when we were moving to Glenville from New York, upstate New York, my father helped me move. He my father was a college coach for 30 years also. And he got out of the truck, the moving truck in Glenville. And he said, son, if you can win here, you can win anywhere. <laughs> so so and I've win. always believed that, like, you know, you can win anywhere and you can lose anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In some certain places, you just got to work a little harder. You know, Fork Union Military Cat, I've always had jobs where you got to work a little harder. Kids just aren't going to show up, talented players. And, and uh, Glenville State's the same. You got to work hard there in West Virginia Tech, even – when I coached at Jefferson Community College, we're five hours from New York City. Did you get New York City players up there? Yeah. You that far yeah. Away? Okay. We were able to get some really good players, you know. Cool. Now, uh, this is a question I ask all prep school coaches, and you've been around this a lot. But what does it take for a guard to play at the D1 level? A guard to play at the D1 level? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know... We had a guard here last year. I was surprised he didn't go to Division One, but I think it was a lot of it was because of the changing times of college basketball. We, we had a kid named Carmelo Pacheco here last year. He was our probably our best player, six four, outstanding shooter. He shot forty seven percent from three, and um, led our team in scoring. He was first team All Elite Prep League, which is a good league. And um, you know, I thought for sure this kid's definitely a low major. He's high IQ, knows how to play, plays off two feet. He just, I think people backed off because he wasn't athletic enough. You know, he's a below the rim player. So I think what division ones are looking for is they're looking for a good size guard. If you're a wing, you know, they would love to have you be six four, six five, six three at least, and be athletic where you can play above the rim, you can run and jump. And um, and then, you know, hopefully they can shoot and handle the basketball and pass and, and have an IQ as well. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that. How has basketball changed since you started coaching back in the Whoa. Oh, no, it's changed big time. Um, the three-point shot has changed a lot. I mean, when I was playing at Ithaca College in the 80s, you know, this 80, my junior year, I think, uh, the three-point shot came in. And that was a challenge. Just and back then, you didn't, people didn't shoot as many threes as they do now. The game's faster paced. I think, this, you know, the game is definitely – all the young coaches are playing five out offense now. I still like to post up some. I'm old school. And um, and then, you know, nobody was, when I first got into coaching, nobody was running ball screens. And then in the middle of my career, now ball screen, everybody's running ball screens. So you had to, I had to learn, you know, ball screen offense and ball screen defense, you know, as as I already was 10 years into my coaching career, you know, and and um, now it's obviously a huge part of the game, ball screen and three-point shots and fast pace. I think players um, have gotten more athletic and and stronger and with this, you know, with the technology and the training and weights and all that. Where, where did ball screens come from? Like, what was there a team that did it that high school and other college coaches started emulating? That, I don't know. I know it was in the game back in the, probably in the 60s, in the 70s and then i think it went out in the 80s and 90s um and then came back in you know because it was definitely in the game in the earlier in the 60s and 70s with in the nba mm -hmm. i believe college too but you know i'm not sure how much and then um, then it came back around big time in in the 2000s Interesting. I just wonder if there's like a team or a program that was winning and then everyone else tried to jump on board with that. There must be. It's just, we just, we just yeah. must not know. Yeah. We're all copycat coaches and <laughs> learn from other coaches. Absolutely. Uh, what's your ultimate goal at Fork Union? Like five years from now, it's a, it goes exactly the way you want it to go. Where, what's Fork Union and your program look like? Well, hopefully, you know, over 95%, close to 100% college placement of all of our players. And um, and the, and it schools that they're happy with, you know. And uh, last year's team was very happy with all the schools they ended up with, so that makes me happy as a coach. And then, um, you know, hopefully we'll get our share of wins. And the, I think at this level, winning is probably not quite as important as as uh, placing the players in the college situation and exposing the players. And so we work hard for that. Um, and then, um, you know, five years from now, hopefully the people that played for me can say, look back and say, I had a great experience playing for Coach Williams at Fork Union and and um, and I enjoyed it and made me better. And, 
and um, and I I'm very happy that I went there, and that's that's what we're hoping for. Great. And and talking about placing your kids, what's your strategy? You know, players are spending the money, they're taking the time, they're leaving home to do prep school, mostly for a post grad year, which you and I are talking about now. Um, so when a family says, "All right, we're going to come there," how are you going to get our son placed at the right fitting school? What do you do? What's your strategy for getting these kids seen, placed, et cetera? Yeah, and you're right. I mean, in our, all of our families of our players are paying something to go here. Yep. You know, um, maybe one's not, but the rest of them are all paying something to varying amounts based on their talent level, basically. So they're, they're invested, you know, and that's what Fork Union wants from an um, administration standpoint, that we want them, the families and the players to feel invested in this, not that they're just given something. But, um, no, I mean, our strategy is just use the contacts that we have <coughs> along. I mean, I've been fortunate. I've, I've been in, in this for a while, as you have. And so you meet a lot of people and then you maintain contacts so with college coaches over the years. And then also um, I get to meet new coaches, you know, constantly. Uh, right. We've already had, we've had what, nine practices and we've had, I believe five division ones have been into our practices to observe and watch our, our team. And, um, and so, you, you know, you, you talk with them and you, um, you, and you, you know, just from a feel standpoint of what I feel like a player's level can be or what his ceiling can be. So we'll target, you know, coaches from around the country and uh, some, and then we'll sit down with our players and, you know, do you, what areas of the country do you want us to look at? And um, most of them, when it comes to Division One, and that's the magic words, Division One, um, they don't care where that is. Now, if it's Division Two, sometimes it becomes, you know, a regional decision. But um, and so, uh, you know, we but we've really told our players the last two years, hey, if you get one offer, celebrate it because it's hard to get offers now with the transfer portal in place. Everybody got an extra year of eligibility. The, the whole thing has changed. So we've had Division One programs tell us, hey, we're not recruiting high school and prep school anymore. We're just taking transfers. In fact, we've actually had people tell us that. So um, and I think I think it's slowly coming back around where preps, preps and high school kids are, are starting to get more recruitment now. You know, COVID really changed things and um, the pandemic and, um, and, and just the transfer portal is a transfer generation now. But um, so there's still great opportunities out there for our players. And, and we try to put them in as many tournaments as possible. And we go to Connecticut and different tournaments in the Carolinas and, and such. And then we put this new elite prep league together <laughs> with um, five schools, uh, three in, in Virginia, the three military academies, Fork Union, Hargrave, Massanutten, and then Perky Omen School and, um, oh, in Winston-Salem. Christian, along with Combine Academy in Mount Zion. Um, so seven school, good programs and schools. Um, and these the commissioners that put this together out of Richmond, Virginia. So we'll have, we'll play some league games and have a big tournament. So we just feel like if we put these teams together, we can maybe get even more exposure for our players and our teams. And, um, and then, um, you know, I, earlier I said winning wasn't important, but we do tell our players if the more you win, the more phone calls we're going to get, you know, yeah. you know, that's just kind of goes with it. So don't be so absorbed with your minutes and your points as you just want to get as much exposure as possible. But the more we win, we will get more looks. Yeah. Love it. All that makes sense. And yeah, when you're in, when you're in those leagues, like these little conferences now that are popping up with elite prep teams. I mean, if you're a college coach, you're going to drive and see one game or go to a weekend event and see five exactly. great games. So it makes perfect sense. You worked with Bobby Huggins throughout the years. You got a good Bobby Huggins story for us? Well, I never worked with Bob Huggins, but I... Um, camps and whatnot, with... I'm talking. Huh? I'm camps. talking camps and whatnot. Not actually on a staff. Yeah, oh yeah. I've, I've worked at, or I've spoken at his clinic and, um, and uh, just developed a you know, relationship with him, but we weren't very close. Um, but he's, he, oh, we did play, um, he did bring his team down. So when we, our school actually, West Virginia Tech moved from um, the Charleston area, Montgomery, West Virginia to Beckley, which not many schools move campuses, but this school moved to camp, whole campus. 
<laughs> he came down. He was friends with our president, Carolyn Long. And he brought his team down and he got an NCAA waiver to play an off campus exhibition game. And um, so we filled our, we had an arena in Beckley, a uh, 4,000 seat arena and place was packed. They came down with Press Virginia a few years back, probably 2016, maybe. Um, and they, they, I mean, they drilled us and uh, <laughs> they just kept pressing and we, we didn't have our whole team ready. We had some injuries and one guy wasn't cleared ac academically, yet, eligibility wise. But um, the funny story is that the game lasted a long time because they kept pressing and there was a lot of fouls. <laughs> the two locker rooms backed up to the same bathroom. So the, there was a ba shared bathroom from West Virginia and West Virginia Tech. As soon as the game ended, me, um, Bob Huggins, and um, oh, forget his funniest. Billy oh, Bill Hahn. Billy Hahn. <laughs> we all rushed into the bathroom and we all had to go to the bathroom so bad at the end of that game. So we even before we spoke to our teams. <laughs> oh, so we were just talk, we were talked about the game as we were using the bathroom there and then went, then went our separate ways. And, um, but um, yeah, coach, it was nice enough. Coach Huggins invited me to speak to his clinic one year and, and uh, we've been up to practice as many times. And, and, um, and so we tried to develop a relationship with him. Yeah. That's a great, that's great. He played you. That's really great. Uh, yeah. You didn't have to do that, but that was a good right. look for that's him. Right. Uh, we're going to finish up here with some quick hitters, Bob. Um, best player you've ever coached against, both in college and then in prep school? Um, there's been so many. Um, best I ever coached against? Or a guy that just lit you up once that you couldn't stop him or just made one of those life, well, lifetime performances? Last year, I don't even know why I can't think of his name. I'm getting old. I can't remember names as well. But the kid at Mass and Nutton last year who, who went to Mississippi State, and he went for, I believe, 50 on us last night or last year. I mean, he just could not miss. He was a six, seven guard and just, just hitting three after three after three. And we had hands on him. It didn't matter what we could do. And he, he's the recent, the best recent, most recent player that has torched us. Gotcha. What's the biggest win in your college coaching career? Um, when I coached in junior college in New York, we had, we got to the national championship games. So maybe a semifinal, but or probably a regional championship at Jefferson Community College. That might have been the biggest win. It's like the the state championship almost in junior college. And then um we had a big win a couple of years ago at home in the, the mid uh um get the name of the conference. Um the West Virginia Tech. We won a conference championship at home. It was just an exciting, you know, last second win students storm the court and we, we've had a lot of great memories over the years great how about your biggest win at fork union so far um uh, probably beat hargrave um uh just christmas championship game here my first year beating hargrave for sure T tell us about that rivalry because i think that's one of the best if not the best in the prep school world yeah i'm sure there's some good ones in new england but um hargrave um and it's only a rivalry if both teams can win some games, you know. Now they beat us um, twice last year, and uh, but we split with them the year before. And um, you know they're pretty much the standard of this level. You know they were number one in the country all last season before they got beaten in the Sweet Sixteen. But um, that's a great rivalry. It's intense, and um, you know, and, and uh, great players on both sides over the years, and, and great coaches as well. Yeah. What's your favorite movie of all time? Um, the Graduate. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Robinson. Yep. <laughs> okay, great. And then what are your hobbies when you're not coaching, Bob? I love golf. Um, been watching a lot of tennis lately. I haven't played much tennis or golf lately, but I watch a lot of golf. You know, I do. I love golf and I watch all the majors, but I watch the golf channel, uh, watch movies. I like to travel a little bit. Okay, great. Uh, where can people find you if they want to learn more about FUMA and, uh, or reach out to you if they're interested in your program? Um, you, you can go to, um, forkunion.com and check out our website. We have an excellent website. We have outstanding school and academics and sports and, um, great leadership, great administration here, great history and tradition, and, um, and great connections. I mean, Fork Union has a lot of people out there, alums that, give a lot of money back to this place and because they had great experience here 
and um, and they're very influential people around the country. <laughs> um, you can reach me at um, my email is Williams R as in Robert Williams R at F U M A dot org. Williams R at Fuma dot org is my email. I'm also on Twitter. I think it's Coach Bob Will, Coach Bob Will, um, and um, Instagram, Facebook. I'll put all that stuff in the show notes too, folks. So you'll you'll have that below. You can just click on it if you want to get to any of this stuff. And just so you know, when Bob mentions the Fort Union Alumni Network, let's say someone played basketball for Bob and a few years later they want to uh, mentor someone on Wall Street, they can call the Fork Union Administration or Alumni Relations Office and see if there's any alums that they can be connected to. And alums love sharing their jobs and their career field with other alums from their school. So not just Fork Union, but all these prep schools, legit ones, not pop-up academies, but legit ones have alumni networks to help you meet other alums in the industry you want to go into. So I know we're talking about basketball, maturing, getting stronger, but like that's one of the huge benefits of prep school. And, you know, like Coach Williams said, you know, Fork Union has industry leaders all over the place that you can be connected with. So just another plug for one of the benefits that come from going to a prep school. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything we didn't touch on uh, in this conversation, Bob, you want to, you want to share or we cover um, it all? I just wanted to ask you, how's the life out in Colorado and the weather and must be a beautiful state. Yeah. I mean, I went to college, prep school and college out here and been trying to get back. And we moved here in 2019 from downtown Washington, DC. And um, as you can see, those that are watching, we've got evergreen trees right outside my office window there. <laughs> nice. And we got elk, elk in our yard and elk in the road. We got to watch out for on our commutes. So it's, uh, it's great. And then Denver's 29 minutes that way. Nice. So it's, it's the good life for us. So we're, we're digging it. We're hoping to bring our team out there maybe next year at the Air and play Air Force prep. I'd love it. Would love it. We'll get you out here and uh, not just them, but some big time JUCOs and make it the trip worth your while. And get your kids in front of some different uh, colleges that probably would never see you on the East Coast. So I think that's perfect. Definitely. It would be great. Thank you. Well, Bob, thanks so much for joining the podcast. If you guys enjoyed this one, be sure to subscribe to us on all the major podcasting platforms. Um, and I really suggest you go to YouTube and subscribe there. we got bonus content. Go to the website, prepathletics.com, to sign up for the newsletter. It comes out once a month. And any questions you have, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is on the website. Thanks to Coach Williams of Fork Union for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.